Good morning to y'all. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a challenge to follow the senator. Uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to spend some time on the phone with Senator Bozeman and discuss some issues, and I have to say that he represents the state of Arkansas very well when he's dealing with us folks here at the Environmental Protection Agency. And I think one of the things that he said I, if, is so, a couple things that I, I, I just want to emphasize is that I did come to this agency in September of 2012 from the state of New Mexico. And our office is in Dallas, and Region 6 is made up of five different states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, plus 66 tribes. And I'm the first non-Texan in the history of EPA ever to hold this position. And what makes that kind of important, I think, is that, you know, Texas is always the big dog in this region. And so whether it's New Mexico or Arkansas or something else, it's it's a little different to have a little different perspective coming from a state other than Texas to come into this position. And then, you know, in New Mexico, I worked for eight years as uh, Secretary of the Environment Department, as was mentioned by Warren. And one of the things that became very clear to me was how much intersection there is between the environment, obviously, and the ag, commu ag com community. And then when I came here, and I worked for a little bit, for Lisa Jackson, who was administrator, and she left shortly after uh, President Obama was elected for his second term. And one of the things that she said as she left, kind of in an exit statement when she was talking to a lot of the media folks about one of the things that as she looked back, maybe she would do something a little different. And she said she needed, as head of the EPA, she needed the agency to develop and understand and have a better working relationship with the ag community in the United States. And that's so true, and that's one of the things that we've tried to do in the last four years is trying to develop that relationship. And one of the things that Senator Bozeman said struck home to me when you talk about what you're expected to do and what you're expected to understand and the clarity that you have to have in the daily business that you operate and you're trying to plan ahead. It's probably one of the most important things that anybody in business needs to understand. And I just want to share with you one of the things. I used to be in the manufacturing business in Albuquerque, New Mexico for a company that's still there. And we rolled steel and we welded it into 30,000 gallon liquid asphalt storage tanks. Very small company, less than 50 people on our payroll. And so we had to make things happen to, uh, to keep these people employed. And I was in charge of marketing and sales throughout the United States and the world. It's a very niche business where these liquid asphalt storage tanks, and you have several of them here in your state of Arkansas, would take liquid asphalt that was pumped into them by transport trucks, heat it up to 300 degrees, and then it would be mixed either in a batch plant or a drum mix plant to make asphalt on, for the roads that we drive on. You see asphalt plants as you drive around the state of Arkansas. And as I drive around the state of Arkansas, I can actually see some product that I had something to do with several years ago. But I was, we were very focused on selling our product we had the opportunity one day to sell our product into the Los Angeles area. In Los Angeles, California, they have a, an environmental area there called the South Coast Air Quality Zone. They're very stringent on what they, what they regulate because of a lot of different reasons. But they, they regulate these days, they will regulate barbecue pits. Uh, they regulate almost anything that has any sort of exhaust. Well, this was in the late 80s. And I made this sale, which was equivalent to about 10% of our annual sales into, for our business. So we were pretty happy. We knew we were going to keep folks employed for a while. We knew we were going to make this, this sale, and it was going to allow us to buy more inventory so that we could go on. You know how that is when you're in business. And so 
I got a call one day from the South Coast Air Quality Zone. And they said, we know that you're going to be putting these tanks into our area and that your tanks, these 30,000 gallon tanks, as you pump liquid asphalt into them, it's going to be discharging air out of your vent pipes into our atmosphere. Is that correct? And I said, yes, it is. And then as, as the asphalt's pumped out, it's also through that same vent pipe, it's going to be causing air to inflowing into the tanks as the asphalt is pumped out. I said, that's also correct. So what we want you to do is when liquid asphalt from transports are being pumped into your tanks, we want you to filter that vent pipe that's on that 30,000 gallon tank. And I said, okay, we'll be glad to do that. I said, what, what are your criteria? What are your requirements for that to happen? My answer was, just start and we'll tell you when you get it right. And I literally, I froze for about five seconds on the phone. And I said, could you repeat that? And they said, well, we don't have any specific criteria now, but you start and we'll tell you when you get it right. So here I am sitting in a little small company where we have two and a half engineers. And I was the half. And we had to figure this out to make this sale of about three and a half million dollars. And so as things went about, we figured out that we took a 55 gallon drum and put it on there and we got it passed and the sale was made and we kept people working and life was good. But it was terrifying because there was no clarity as to what I was supposed to do. So when I came to EPA, I told this story to Lisa Jackson. I also told it to Gina McCarthy, who is now the administrator. And as we work with states and we work with businesses and we work with the ag community, I tell our folks in Dallas, I told my folks in Santa Fe, we are obligated to do the best job that we can to provide clarity to those people that we are working with from a regulatory point of view. And when Senator Bozeman talked about providing a way or a clarity for the things that, that he's doing and making people understand, I completely agree. And one of the things, too, that comes from all that is that, you know, we have found things that we have done, whether, you know, the, the Senator talked about waters of the U.S. Certainly something that's important to every person in this room. And Senator Bozeman and I may look at that, that piece of legislation from a different point of view. It has stayed, or this regulation, it has stayed it is right now, as we all know, for us doing anything. But one of the things that that piece of legislation and that rule tries to do is to make things more clear as to what we're doing. And even today, there's a lot of misunderstanding, disagreement as to what the rule does. And whether, whether I see it one way or the senator sees it one way, the important thing is that we have to provide for the people who are most affected by it, the people in this room, we have to find a way to work together to provide clarity as to what you're supposed to do day to day when you're working in the ag business. We have spent a lot of time trying to build relationships because one of the things that I think that, that you saw today that the senator is known for is trying to work across the aisle to get things done, to be a statesman, as was mentioned here. And that's one of the things that we at EPA are trying to do as well. We realize that a lot of the work that we do is controversial. We realize that sometimes you can just say EPA in a room and that will get people's attention. But we work very hard to try to understand the issues. I've been in this job almost four years now and I've been in Arkansas dozens of times talking to Teresa Marks when she was secretary, talking to Becky Kehoe when she was secretary. 
We had Wes and Zach in Dallas a few months ago talking about the ag issues here in Arkansas. Traveled around the state of Arkansas because it's important for us to understand and for me to tell our folks that I work with in Dallas what the needs and wants of the people of Arkansas are so that we can be better at what we do by listening to what you do. And you, we talk about oil and gas being important in Region 6, as was mentioned when I was introduced. That on any given day, we have 62 to 66 percent of the oil and gas production in the United States. But when you look at those five states, I always like to remind people that 25 percent of the land area in Region 6 is devoted to agriculture and has been for a long time. So it's important whether you're talking about air issues, whether you're talking about water issues or land issues, that the input from the agricultural community is key. I think as, as we've traveled around the, the, the state of Arkansas and we've, we've talked about things, I'll be talking with Secretary Keogh later on today but we've continued to build these relationships, whether, it's, whether we're talking about issues regarding clean water or whether we're talking about clean power. And I just cannot emphasize enough the importance of the relationship that is being built. I'll give you a slight example about Texas again. We talked, it was made, a point was made during the introduction of, of me about the greenhouse gas. The state of Texas got behind the eight ball on developing a greenhouse gas program because for a lot of reasons, a lot of political reasons. And so it, all of a sudden, all this great development was coming to the Gulf Coast of Texas that would affect the entire state of Texas and to a certain extent, the entire region. They had no greenhouse gas permitting pro program. So we've worked together to put that program together so that the end result was is that we passed out 80 greenhouse gas permits working with the state of Texas that literally had about a $50 billion impact on the economy of South Texas and Central Texas. Here in Arkansas, we work daily trying to figure out ways to handle what we call impaired waters in the United States. We work with the state of Oklahoma and the state of Arkansas on the Illinois River watershed trying to figure out the conflicts between the two states that exist there. But you cannot get there without having relationships to build it. And it's more than just patting each other on the backside and saying, you know, nice to see you, we'll, you know, so forth and so on. You have to get down to where you're actually putting a product on the table that serves the community. So, as I have the opportunity to come back to Arkansas and talk about various issues, whether we talk about things on the east side of the state, in the Delta areas, whether we talk about some of the things at Georgia Pacific over there in the area of environmental justice, whether we talk about things in western Arkansas, whether we talk about the, the great bike paths and environmental improvements over in, in Bentonville area, we can go on and on about how the state of Arkansas has done things differently that the whole rest of the United States and the region can benefit from. If we look here in Little Rock with Mayor Stodola and the work that he has done working with us in downtown Little Rock trying to help rebuild downtown in an environmentally sensitive green way and some of the things that now cities all over the United States are looking to Little Rock to do, it's another sign of the relationships building and trying to keep in mind that the final product is dependent upon the people that we serve. So I would like to ask you all, when you think about EPA and you think about some of the controversies that we, we find ourselves in, is that we, we look for the best environmental outcome. But keeping that in mind, the best environmental outcome oftentimes 
brings great economic multipliers to it. And we can have debates about that, but we are all in the same boat together trying to get to a place where we have good environmental outcomes that brings good economic outcomes along with it. And you can't do that without the relationships that, that we continue to build and without the attempts to solve problems rather than just exasperate them. So I'm honored to be here today. I think so. Thanks for inviting me. And one of the things, one of the things that I need some help on, I had the opportunity to download your 20 page, nice nine, nine billion changes everything off of the website. And there's some great information in there. But I need some help because one of the things that caught my eye because I eat a lot of hamburgers, I mean, I eat too many hamburgers, is that I, a single hamburger is the subject of 41,000 state and federal regulations. It says so in your thing here, and that's a fascinating number to me. <laughs> and so I'm hoping to find out somewhere what role we play, EPA plays in those 41,000 regulations to make a hamburger. So if anybody in here has an answer to that or can point me in a direction of figuring out what part of that we are involved in, I'd like to know. But your brochure is, is very informative, it's very thought provoking, and I really appreciate you all having me here, and if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. You talked about uh, clarity and miscommunications, uh, misunderstandings. Yes. Can you give us a little clarity on uh, why we want to expand from navigable waters to all waters, where we'll be a little more clear? Okay. You know, I will say this about the clean water rule. I think as the as EPA, as the agency, started to roll that out, we could have done a much better job as far as trying to tell people what we thought was in the rule. One of the simplest things, I have an a, a, a old friend that runs a cotton farm in Louisiana, and he used to be head of the national, one of the national cotton bureaus. And it's it's our belief that if you don't need if you don't have a if you don't need a permit to do something today on your farm under the new rule you won't need a permit to do that either so as you as you look forward to what we see in the rule and what navigable waters are you know they're not potholes in the ground and they're not going to become federal properties and they're not going to be regulated by us. And so what has happened is that I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. I come from a very arid state of New Mexico. The beginnings of the Rio Grande are about that wide in certain areas of northern New Mexico. Those are obviously not navigable waters, and they will not be changed by the proposed new rule. And there are areas of Arkansas that would fall into the same category. So the, the short answer is, is that we're trying to provide clarity, and there's a great gap of what, of misunderstanding of what we believe we're saying versus what people say that we're say, saying that what, what we're saying. And, and I suppose that there were some Supreme Court decisions that took place regarding uh, things that happened up in Illinois that have had a great impact as far as adding to the confusion. But I, I think what needs to happen as we continue to go forward, there just needs to be a lot more discussion of understanding what we're proposing because I've been in situations where that same question has been asked to me and we've sat down side by side on a specific farm and said, 
No, this rule will not impact that. No, this rule will not impact that. And, and the, the, the farmer would say, well, I've been told that it does. And so it's that sort of detailed information that has to take place to make sure that we all understand where we're headed. We don't see this as a federal power grab. Again, I look at things that we call arroyas in New Mexico. They would not fall under this regulation either. So, you know, people are concerned about ponds that they have on their property. If you don't need a permit for those now and it's an agricultural property, you wouldn't need it going forward under the new rule. The new rule has been stayed and, and more conversation is going to come out of it. But I think, I, I think everybody has to, at this point, kind of have to sit down and look at real facts as they, as they apply to specific pieces of property so that you can get a better understanding of what goes on. And, you know, I'm certainly willing to do that, however our folks willing to do that. But we have to be conscious of the fact that, that the rule has been stayed at this point. So it, we're kind of back into this, this, this kind of quagmire of, of uncertainty. And we, we need to find ways to have this communication to get us out of it. And uh, long answer to your question, but the disagreements or the perceived disagreements that exist out there have to be addressed directly. And, and we all kind of have to step back and, and look at things very specifically. Mr. Curry, uh, appreciate you being here today. Uh, and we certainly appreciate your attitude towards working with people over the, your predecessor that you replaced. My concern is the Illinois River TMDL, uh, which uh, your agency is working on. And as I understand it, the model that has been developed uh, by EPA or by the contractors, I'm not sure which, considers every stream to be the same width and depth that's going into the Illinois River, which is not the way that uh, the streams and rivers work. And do you have any feel for how long uh, that will be till the TMDL is done, or we wait on the stressor response study that's going on uh, before that TMDL is released? We've got some uh, gatherings coming up, I believe, in the third week of April that are going to take place between the state of Arkansas and the state of Oklahoma. And uh, I, I'm going to be chatting with Secretary Kehoe about that, but it's the next step I can tell you as far as moving the process along, I think is the third week in April, so it's not too far from now. And the discussions over phosphorus and, and everything that you mentioned there uh, are ongoing. Uh, it's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. And you've got two very definitive different opinions between two states. And, um, but we're not shy about trying to get it finished and, and staying engaged and making sure that we recognize the very different uh, scientific opinions that are being addressed. So um, the next step, like I said, I believe is the third week in April. And, and we, have, we have pushed to try to get a, a very I hate to use the word common sense because, you know, everybody, one man's ceiling is another man's floor sort of thing. But we've worked really hard trying to make sure that the model is a fair one and uh, the, the issues that you mentioned are certainly points of disagreement in, in that discussion. But we are, we are pushing to get to some sort of resolution. And that's why this next meeting is the third week in April. You mentioned that uh, this waters of the U.S. really wouldn't change any regulations on farms. And so, one, what would be the benefit of changing it if it's not going to change anything? And then what issues are you seeing that we need to involve more waters instead of just navigable waters? I think...
some people might say, my friend in the back of the room, David Gray, might say, uh-oh, he's going to say something that he... <laughs> I think one of the things that we have to work on, on, on waters of the U.S. that's so important, is making sure that we as the federal government, working with our federal partner, the Corps of Engineers, with their many districts across the United States, has a, a, a consistent approach across the country, recognizing that there are differences in waters across the country. But the interpretation of the rule has to be consistent from one uh, district of the Corps of Engineers to, to another. Um, and I'll go back to my friend at the cotton farm to talk about your question of how we wouldn't need any permits. He was, he was, uh, he was talking, he's always managing his water. He's from Monroe, Louisiana. And he always is managing his water, trying to look for innovative ways of managing his crops and how the water flows in and out. And of course, they've got quite a bit of water in, in Monroe. And, and so as he was moving his man management around, he would ask us as to, well, if I do this, will it affect it? And the answer was almost universally no. And so what he decided, and this point is up for debate as well, what he decided is that the, the overall concepts at the 30,000-foot level were the things that were perhaps changing the most, and the specific things down on the ground on the farm were the things that were things that were being less impacted as looking at the overall rule. And so I think, too, is that when we, when we start talking about um, things that we do and the things that the Corps of Engineers does as far as managing larger bodies of water, I think that, too, is a, an impact that is different than, than what we're talking about managing a smaller amount on a particular farm. And I think that's where a lot of the misunderstanding or the you know, better education needs to take place as far as what we think the rule's going to do versus what somebody else may think the rule's going to do. There's, there's just, uh, there's just, you know, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning is that there's so much confusing surrounding where the rule is right now before we even started to propose changes in it that it, it seems to make the whole thing even more challenging because you're trying to add some clarity to something that doesn't seem to want to want to have clarity to it because there's been so many different interpretations to it. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard problem. And, but I guess I'm still kind of at the place where is if you look, if you pull an individual property out where you're looking at one person's farm or agricultural piece of property that they're trying to manage, and you lay down it and look at what that proposed rule is trying to do, the impacts are, are minimal and the clarification becomes greater. And, and it, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but I think that's where we're going to have to go is to get, you know, people look at it on a very microscopic level as to how they would be impacted. Curry. Yes. I, I appreciate you coming today and listening to our, you know, our gripes and complaints and uh, want to talk to you. For one thing I want to say, there's, there's no better environmentalist than a farmer. We have to take care of our, our you know, our ground and to, to be productive. And I want to talk to you about an issue that's been going on for more than, a lot longer than the waters of the U.S. rule. It's back, um, it's uh, on the Cache River. And back in the late 60s, they started to drain, uh, clean the Cache River out. Cleaned it out for seven miles. Where they stopped, you know, the, they stopped us from cleaning it out. Well, you go back today, and where they cleaned it out, the trees are still good. 
and everything because it drinks. But from from seven miles north up 50, 60 miles, everything's pretty much dead. And you know, and what I'm what I'm kind of getting at is we need some drainage, and we need cooperation both ways. It seems like that we we're all that we get all the we are all the ones giving and no nothing back. You know, it seems like well we can't do this and we can't do that. And it seems like, and you talked about cooperation. Well, I'd like to have cooperation in a sit-down meeting to talk about doing something with the Cash River because it's starting to affect, it's starting to affect a lot of good cropland that, uh, you know, we're not clearing any more land, and we're not, uh, we're trying to do the best we can and trying to use our water the best we can. But it seems to me that we're not getting any help back the other way when we are trying to do things right. And, uh, you know, we have people that's far away from our operations making our decisions for us, and it's tough. And so, and it's starting to affect a lot of communities, a lot of tax bases, just a lot of things. And I wanted to draw that to your attention and just uh, hope that uh, we could have uh, meetings and try to resolve some of this because it's uh, beginning to affect a lot of uh, families. So, okay. thank you. Let me just ask, uh, uh, have, what... What, ha what kind of meetings have you had with the state at this point on that? Uh, we've been having meetings for 20 or 30 years, but it seems like we always get a lawsuit filed because some environmentalists think they're doing the right thing, and they're not doing the right thing when they're killing all the timber. Even even your fish and wildlife service <coughs> guy is going to be here after a while. You know, they're worried about the settlement coming down and getting into trees, but if it don't drain and it sits in the flood culture all year, it kills the timber. Well, that's not good for anybody. What we're doing right now is not working. So we need cooperation from everybody to meet together and try to come up with, I think farmers would be willing to give, but we need something from the other side. It seems like the last 50 or 60 years, we don't get anything. We have to give. And that's, that's uh, I mean, that's our issue. Okay. And, and it's, it's getting to be a problem. People put up levees, which is causing more problems. And, you know, it's just, it's tough. I'd be interested in having some more conversation with you about what role EPA has played or what you think we could do or, or working with the state, stuff like that. Right. Well, I think y'all, you and Fish and Wildlife Service and everybody, you know, when we try to do something, no, you can't do that because they're thinking we're coming out there and, and bulldozing 100 acres or 1,000 acres of timber. That's not what we're trying to do. You know, I think us as a community know what's best for our land know what's best for the trees. We're not trying to clean the, you know, destroy the whole world. We're just trying to make a living. And it's, it's just really hard to do that right now. We have a log jam. A log jam comes from all the timber that's died because it's still got to drain. I mean, timber's got to have dry areas to survive. They can't sit in a flooded culture. And when they sit in a flooded culture, they die, which causes it to run into the river, which stops it up. And, you know, I mean, this has been going on since the late 60s. We, we tried to get it cleaned out. When they cleaned it out for seven miles, you can get up in an airplane and you can see, man, that looks great up there. You know, no timber's been destroyed. <coughs> great environment, you know. But from there north where they didn't clean it out, well, it's a wasteland. Like I, I said, I said, the beavers leave because there's no <laughs> green timber for them to chew on. All you got is the snakes and turtles. <laughs> But uh, I just, I wanted to draw that to your attention. Okay. I don't know, and, and I know people in Arkansas know about it, and I, you know, but it seems to be it don't get to the, the federal level. It just seems that's as far as it goes. Thank you. You bet. Mr. Kerr? Yes, sir. Um, I'm Rich Hillman, and I'm a rice farmer from about 30 miles of here, uh, east, uh, sixth generation farmer. And uh, I, I, like Joe and the rest of the group, we really appreciate you coming. Your attitude toward agriculture, uh, the dialogue that we're having today. Uh, but after you leave, we have to deal with EPA every day on our farms and ranches. Uh, not too long ago, the EPA came out with uh, uh, on-farm fuel retention and uh, having to build retention walls or the other choice that we had 
was dropping the gallons of, of the capacity of tanks down to less than a thousand gallons. And uh, we had, had tried to get an ag exemption. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a major spill or a major problem on farms, uh, but, but it was, it was a, a burdensome problem that we're still dealing with today that is very, very expensive for farmers and ranchers, not only across Arkansas, but across the United States. And it has created another problem with, with the, the lack of, of using the big tanks that we had, uh, it, we're having to transfer and transport fuel more often than we ever have before for the simple fact that we're not gonna spend millions of dollars out on our farms and ranches building these retaining walls. And after a, a number of us built the retaining walls, then we found out we have to catch the water that comes out, the rainwater, whether there's a spill or not, and account and document that. To me, that has created a, a, a whole nother problem when there wasn't a problem. And a few years ago, I went to Washington on behalf of, of um, American Farm Bureau and Arkansas Farm Bureau and testified about the overreaching uh, effects of EPA on our poultry farmers. And, and uh, we're still continually having to jump through specific hoops that are unnecessary, kind of like this fuel retention. And, and at the time, we were fighting an issue of exhaust fans on, on poultry houses. And if the dust of those exhaust fans blew out and landed outside the house that somehow, some way, that that piece of dust would get into a navigable waterway, then, then we were going to be regulated. I'm not telling you anything that these folks don't know, but the American farmer and rancher are better than anybody in the world at what we do. Why would we ever want to stifle that? Why would we ever want to stifle it? And again, I appreciate your, your conversation with us, but from our side looking, we're constantly dealing with more and more regulations from the EPA, and that is stifling. It's creating a, another cost. It's creating uh, so many more people having to pay so much more for their food and fiber and shelter. Thank you. Well just a short response and and y'all are the final decision makers or de people that would decide whether this is true or not one of the things that we have tried very hard to do in the last four years under the administration of Gina McCarthy is for the people in our agency to think about a couple of things. And it's, it, it, and you know some things don't happen overnight, but one of the things that the administrator has stressed over and over and over again is a thing that we call rule implementation. And there is no point in developing a rule that in if you don't in the process of developing that rule you don't look downrange as to how it's going to be implemented and the effects of that implementation are going to be Gina is often quoted and has said to me nothing happens inside the beltway it all happens outside the beltway we can write a rule in Washington, D.C., but it's implemented in Fayetteville or Little Rock or Hot Springs or Bentonville. And so you have to figure out what that rule implementation really is. So that process, that sort of thinking that goes on inside the agency has been put into motion by the administrator. 
And we talk about it every day, literally, in what we're trying to do, because it, it goes exactly to your point. It's so I think I hear you. And I, and I know the administrator hears you. When we're trying to get to that point is that we're trying to see, we may think we may have a great rule that does good for the environment and does good for the economy, but if you can't implement it at your place, then it, it probably needs to be looked at again. And that's kind of the problem we got into with the clean water rule, is that there was not an understanding of implementation because we thought it was saying something different and other people thought it said something entirely different. So that's what we're trying to do is look at rule, implement, rule implementation. That's kind of a weird sounding thing, but that's, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. Thank you. All right, thank you all.